Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Petrosky with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. Our focus today will be on Japan's role in the global palm oil and timber markets. In our recent report on Japan, we found that Japan is a large buyer of palm oil and timber products from Indonesia and Malaysia. While the country has promoted sustainability ahead of the, this year's Olympics, sourcing policies are still deemed inadequate. In this context, Japan's large demand for palm oil and plywood is linked to deforestation and leakage markets for both commodities. Japan is the fourth largest financier of oil palm concessions after Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. We'll be discussing these issues and more during today's event. A few housekeeping issues before we move forward. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A and we will aim to answer them after our presentation. Our main speakers today will be Sarah Dross of A Environment, Ender Kainar of Profundo, and Yuki Mikami of Abovo. And now I'd like to hand it over to Sarah. Yes, thank you, Matt. Uh, so I will first start with some general trends on the imports of palm oil and timber in Japan. Then I will show how uh, the Japanese import for plywood uh, link with deforestation for palm oil development. And I will highlight the role of several key Japanese players in buying leakage palm oil and timber. So just for clarification with uh, leakage, we refer to unsustainable palm oil and timber, and that is non-compliant with so-called NDPE commitments. So NDPE stands for no deforestation, no peatland, and no exploitation. So Japanese imports of palm oil mainly originate from Malaysia and Indonesia, largely for food processing and for biomass power generation. So if you look at the left figure in yellow, you see that the demand for palm oil lane is relatively stable, whereas the demand for palm steroin uh, is, is growing. And this palm steroin is used for, as power, for power plants to, uh, to function. Um, this largely relates to the Japanese feed in tariff system, the so-called FIT system. Uh, and this is a Japanese government renewable energy support scheme since 2012. It became operational in 2012, 2014, when the first biomass power plants um, started working. And since then, we see that uh, the imports of palm oil and woody biomass are growing. And actually, the use of this palm oil as fuel for, fuel for power plants is quite controversial because we know that uh, palm oil expansion links to deforestation. Uh, Japan has so far uh, delayed twice the requirement for certified palm oil use in power plants. So it was first due for March 2019 and it was delayed twice already and now it will be April 2022. Next slide please. So also related to this uh, feed and tariff system is a steep rise in the imports of palm kernel shells since 2014. So palm kernel shells are a byproduct of, uh, of palm oil processing uh, and it's relatively cheap and, uh, and also very reliable feedstock for power plants. So since uh, the use of palm kernel shells was authorized under the FIT system, we can see uh, this very steep rise. Uh, and for instance, at the moment, it's about two and a half million metric tons of imports yearly in Japan. And it is expected that in 2025, it will reach as high as five million metric tons. So the majority of these palm kernel shells originate from Indonesia. And so far, uh, environmental certification schemes have not included uh, palm kernel shells. So there was some research that between 2018 and 2019, only one fifth of all uh, PKS produced in Indonesia and Malaysia was derived, that derived from uh, RSPO certified oil palm plantations. So I listed here the main Japanese importers of palm kernel shells. 
which include Hanwa, Erex, uh, Sumitomo Forestry, and Itoshu Corporation. And they will all come back in the, in the next part of this presentation. Next slide, please. So now looking at plywood, uh, we see that Japan is Indonesia's largest buyer of uh, plywood. And this plywood is largely used for housing construction uh, and flooring. Uh, also, you can see from the figure on the left that there has been a recent decline uh, in the demand for plywood. And this is largely linked to the COVID-19 pandemic as well to uh, Japanese demographics because generally uh, the Japanese population is declining. So there is a need for smaller housing units and that also links to a decline in demand for plywood combined also with the growth of the domestic production of wood products. So the main uh, importers of plywood in Japan are Sumitomo Forestry, Sojits Building Materials and Itochu Kanzai and the others are mentioned here. Um, again, we already saw that Sumitomo Forestry and Itochu were also uh, part of the largest buyers of palm kernel shells and they will continue to appear also in this presentation and in the report you can also read more details about these companies. Next slide, please. So this buying of timber and uh, pl of plywood and of palm oil is happening in this context of the upcoming Tokyo Olympics that are actually promoted by Japan as being sustainable games because they have adopted sustainable sourcing policies for palm oil, timber, paper, and other agricultural products. So the procurement of these products require that they, uh, they are certified under an approved certification scheme, such as RSPO, MSPO, or ISPO. And with, with this also, with the Tokyo Olympics, it is also said that, that there is an increased interest in sustainability issues in Japan. I think this quote uh, from USDA Gain really nicely illustrates this, as it says that while the use of palm oil from tropical nations has long been a controversial issue in the West, the Tokyo Olympic Games introduced the issue to Japan. Um, as a means of promoting sustainability, we see that numerous Japanese companies have uh, become an RSPO member in the last five years. So the membership jumped from 37 to 2021 20, in the last five years. And while we see a lot of uh, yeah, actions to promote sustainability, we at the same time see that the genuine impact has yet to be received, uh, achieved. Because, for instance, we see that uh, while there is this huge increase in RSPO membership, we also know that, that of all this RSPO certified palm oil, the large part of it is still mixed with uncertified volumes. So 90%, 98% of it uh, imported in Japan was classified as either mass balance, MB, or book and claim. And that means that the large part of it is still originating from unmonitoring, unmonitored supply chains or mixed with untraceable conventional palm oil. And also NGOs have flagged that these Olympic sourcing policies that they do not fully address environmental concerns. For instance, there is a lack of disclosure of procurement results uh, and there was also a lack of external review of the sourcing code. Next slide, please. So after showing some of these trends, uh, I will now turn to some of the major buyers, first of palm oil and then of plywood. So in the figure on the right, we see uh, the seven largest importers of Indonesian palm oil. And I have to note here that it's very important to realize this is only Indonesian exports of palm oil because unfortunately we do not have data on Malaysian exports of palm oil. Uh, so the top seven importers of palm oil from Indonesia are Mitsui, Sojits, Mitsubishi, Itochu. So already you see 
some of the names keep coming back uh, in the tables and in the report and in this presentation. And we can also see that they largely source from, from Muzimas, from Royal Golden Eagle and from Wilmar International. And they all are NDPE compliant. So we calculated that 97% uh, of the palm oil coming from Indonesia in this period, 2019-2020, is NDPE compliant. Although I also have to say that being NDPE compliant doesn't mean that that palm oil is also really sustainable because we know for instance that Royal Golden Eagle is recently uh, involved in uh, serious compliance issues in its pulp and paper chain uh, and also previously in its uh, palm oil supply chain division Epical. Uh, if you want further information about this, I also refer to the report or also to Aid Environment website on pulp and paper. But generally, we concluded that leakage risk will likely not be too high from this direct import by NDPE traders. Uh, next slide, please. But on the other hand, fast moving consumer good companies, Japanese companies that consume large amounts of palm oil, they do have a higher leakage risk. Uh, for instance, downstream company Cow Corporation, uh, they sourced in 2020 446,000 metric tons of palm oil products. And the company states that uh, about 11 to 20% of its procurement is spent on uh, purchasing palm oil and palm oil products for its consumer good business and chemical business. Also, the company says that nearly 90% of its revenues are dependent on products containing palm and palm oil palm oil and palm oil products. Fuji Oil Holdings is actually the, the largest consumer uh, of palm oil and palm oil products, largely from Malaysia. Uh, so in 2019, it consumed nearly 800,000 metric tons of palm oil products. And similar to Cow Corporation, it also states to procure 11 to 20% of its total procurement on, on palm oil and palm oil products. So since both companies uh, disclosed their supplier mail list, which is actually for a company like Cow, it's quite special because it's only one of the few companies that does disclose these palm supplier lists. Uh, but it did enable us also to do uh, uh, an analysis on the deforestation in their supply chains. And for Fuji oil, we calculated that they are exposed to 4,733 hectares of deforestation and peat development in its palm supply chain in 2020. And for Cow Corporation, this was 9,523 hectares. So this is also considerable leakage palm oil in their supply chain. Next slide, please. So what we did uh, in the report is that we made a table for both Cow Corporation and Fuji Oil, where we showed which were the highest, uh, which were the largest deforesters in the supply chain. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in detail in this uh, webinar, but if you're interested in this report, you can see, for instance, for Cow Corporation, all the, the supplier groups that have deforested over 400 hectares in the last years, in 2020. Um, and we saw that, for instance, for cow from their supplier list of 1,027 suppliers, 57 of them were non-compliant with the NDP commitments, and they deforested 9,523 hectares in total in Indonesia and Malaysia in 2020. So also for Fuji oil, we have prepared such a table and you can look at it at the report. Next slide, please. So now have a look at the key uh, plywood exporters to Japan. So as I mentioned, Japan is the largest buyer of uh, Indonesian plywood. And in this figure, you see the top 10 plywood exporters to Japan. 
Um, and, and what it actually shows also this table is how the demand for Indonesian plywood is also linked to leakage palm oil. And that is because out of these 10 groups, seven of them also uh, operate palm oil plantation. And in these palm oil plantations, we saw a combined clearing of over 15,000 hectares between 2016 and 2020. So none of these, uh, of these plywood exporters has an overall NDPE policy that, uh, that covers its full plantation business. Only for Harita Group and for Sampurna, we know that they do have an NDPE commitment for their palm oil divisions, for instance, for Harita Group through Bumitama. But at the same time, there's none of these companies that have a, a, an overall policy that covers all its operations. And so it can happen that while they even supply uh, certified plywood, for instance, for stewardship council label, we still see that they continue to deforest in their palm oil operations. So what is not in this table, but what is very relevant to mention is that the three largest importers of this plywood are Sumitomo Forestry, Ituchu, Kenzai and Sojits. Next slide, please. So this will be my last slide. Um, and it's actually a kind of summary of much that I have told already in the presentation. And that will also be apparent if you read the report is that it, it remains the same companies that, keep, that are keep coming back in the report. So these are five major Japanese trading corporations that have businesses in many segments. And they are Itochu, Mitsui, Sojits, Mitsubishi, and Sumitomo. And they, they, we, we, we could link them in the report to, to leakage of palm oil and plywood, or and or plywood. Um, yes, yeah, so I will just highlight them here. Um, and if you look at their NDPE commitments, actually Itochu is uh, most advanced. Itochu is also the largest shareholder of uh, Fuji Oil Holdings. Uh, and it has a group level NDPE policy for all its plantation business for rubber, timber and palm oil. And it's also ambitious in the sense that it uh, aims for sourcing sustainable palm oil 100% by 2025, while the others only state uh, 2030. And also the company discloses its supplier mail list. If you look at Mitsui and Mitsubishi, they have a weak, uh, are, we consider it to be a weak NDPE policy because they do mention uh, NDPE commitments or procurement, but at the same time, it is not really a full policy because they do not mention a no burning policy. They do not talk about free and prior informed consent. Uh, they do not mention grievous mechanisms, for instance. And they also uh, only have 100% sustainable palm oil by 2030. And Sojits and Sumitomo, both construction companies, uh, they do not have any commitments. Um, in terms of their roles, uh, you see that Itochi, for instance, uh, they were mentioned in the report as the fourth importer of Indonesian palm oil, the eighth importer of Indonesian palm kernel shells, uh, its subsidiary Itochu Kenzai is the third importer of plywood and it's also among the top clients of Japanese financial institutions. And that part, uh, Ender, my colleague, will continue on after me. Um, Mitsui and Mitsubishi, they are ranked first and third importer of Indonesian palm oil. So again, please be reminded that we only talk about Indonesian exports of palm oil here and not Malaysian. Uh, but their palm oil operations represent less than 1% of their total procurement. Um, Sojit uh, is the second import of Indonesian palm oil and the second import of Indonesian plywood. So they are actually playing a large role, but at the same time we know they have no NDPE policy covering their palm and timber operations, so leakage is very likely which is also confirmed because from the, the top 10 exporting plywood 
groups that I mentioned before. They all supply, almost all of them supply to Sojits uh, without any uh, NDPE policies and also with a lot of deforestation in their palm oil operations. Also Sumitomo Corporation, which is the first importer of Indonesian plywood, Sumitomo Forestry, uh, they are linked to illegal and unsustainable logging. For instance, one uh, key example is through Corindo. So you might have heard that uh, Corindo supplied plywood that was imported by uh, Sumitomo Corporation and that was linked to deforestation and it was used to uh, construct one of the venues for the Tokyo Olympics. Um, so also in general, the weak NDPE policies will uh, likely uh, and make sure that, or it will happen that uh, leakage palm oil uptake is likely. Uh, and for Itochu, we were also able to uh, to check their suppliers and we found 4,538 hectare clearing linked to palm oil expansion in 2020. And Itochu Kansai also received plywood from non-compliant palm oil suppliers. So this was my uh, part of the presentation. I will now give the floor to Ender Kainar of Profundo who will continue about financial analysis. Uh. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so uh, we also took a look at uh, Japanese financial institutions in their role in uh, the palm oil sector and also the timber sector. So um, uh, Japan, Japanese financial institutions were the fourth largest uh, financier of palm oil sector uh, in Southeast Asia. And well, uh, with identified uh, financing flows uh, to the sector, we see on average uh, almost 900 million US dollars uh, between uh, 2013 and 2019. And we see a rise in 2014, it's mainly due to a, a one of um, the financing provided to Sign Darby uh, for the acquisition of NB Paul. And well, uh, it's uh, the, the financing is actually concentrated uh, on uh, three financial institutions, uh, which are Mitsubishi, UFJ Financial, Mizuho Financial, and SMBC Group. Uh, the next slide, please. And uh, in terms of the clients of these financial institutions, we see the uh, Salim Group uh, at, at the top at, with uh, identified financing received at. Uh, 1.8 billion with this, uh, within this uh, six year period. And we see also Jardine Madison Group, Sinar Mas Group, and Vilmar also at the top of the list. And uh, the next slide, please. So, in the report, we, uh, we made detailed uh, tables to, uh, for you to uh, go through, uh, but uh, we always see these three financial institutions, Musico, SMBC, and Mitsubishi Financial, as the top financiers for all um, the all the names, all the companies that we mentioned. Also for exporters from uh, Indonesia, and also importers to uh, Japan. And we see Fuji Oil and Kao Corporation, as Sarah mentioned before. Uh, as uh, recipients of financing from uh, Japanese financial institutions. Next slide, please. And also for the, the timber exporters and importers, we see Japanese financial institutions uh, active in financing these uh, supply chains. And the next slide, please. So in total, uh, we see over uh, 2.5 billion uh, financing from Mitsubishi and Mizuho and uh, almost 2 billion financing from uh, SMBC Group uh, for, the, for the total uh, palm oil and timber uh, product uh, supply chains. And the next slide, please. And then we took uh, a deeper uh, look at Cow Corporation and Fuji Oil. And, uh, because with their uh, uh, CDP uh, disclosures, they disclose uh, uh, huge amounts of palm oil imports, 
and that puts uh, their businesses and their uh, actually investors at risk in the event of a uh, reputation damaging uh, event, let's say. So, uh, and they also with the uh, CDP disclosures, they also calculate their own risks, uh, own financial risk calculations, and they base it on, on the uh, lost revenues uh, due to some of the clients or some of their customers being more sensitive to reputation damaging events. And we also made the calculations ourselves uh, with only the lost revenues that they, they uh, calculated, the valuation impact would be almost five times larger than uh, what they calculated uh, on their company valuations, so directly to their investors. And that uh, the impact of a reputation risk could be even bigger uh, based on a study of uh, historical events in uh, public companies that the valuations could be reduced as much as 30% for uh, companies that doesn't uh, uh, make a good uh, response to uh, these uh, reputation risk events. So for Cal, uh, compared to their almost $600 million risk estimate on CDP, the, the financial risk could be as much as uh, $9.6 billion. And for Fuji, uh, for their $62 million risk estimate, the risk actually could be uh, $750 million US dollars for the investors. And the next slide, please. And this is what we base our calculations for the risk, the cost of response. Uh, for, uh, to mitigate this financial risk, uh, Cow and Fuji Oil could uh, spend more on ex execution costs and uh, for monitoring costs for palm oil. And we take a benchmark palm oil execution cost per ton at uh, $65. Uh, that is uh, from uh, an earlier study of CRR. And when we apply to their uh, this this number to their whole value chain, uh, we see that Cal as as an FMCG as the uh, last company to set the prices. If Cal set uh, uh, made a 0.2 percent increase on their palm oil uh, related products, then it could make the benchmark calculation costs. Uh, or pass on the calculation costs to the cost consumer, so it's really uh, insignificant. And for Fuji, as being a, a, a company in between uh, the consumer and the producer, so a B2B company, uh, the consumer value for Fuji's uh, products could in, uh, should increase 3%, almost 3% for, uh, let's say, Fuji's margins to be uh, to stay uh, where they are. So these are not really big uh, costs for the whole um, uh, value chain, uh, which could protect uh, the investors uh, of Fuji Oil and Cal. And for the last slide for myself, next slide, uh, we talk about um, uh, the investors that we mentioned is Actually, the Fuji Oil is 41% of Fuji Oil is owned by Itochi and its group companies. It's a total. And Itochi is uh, owned 35% by foreign investors. And uh, also, Car Corporation, uh, although they don't have a direct uh, parent company, 44% uh, of the company is owned by uh, foreign investors. So, foreign investors have room to engage with these two companies. And uh, with, with huge palm oil uh, imports, uh, but they are at risk of these reputation uh, risking events. And yeah, that, that was my presentation. Okay. Am I on? Hello.
Kyle. Yeah, hi, and now it's over to uh, Yuki Mikami. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you all. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this event. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to join you here. Um, my name is uh, Yuki Mikami, and um, I am uh, running the company, uh, creative production company called Abovo in Tokyo. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about, um, well, the, the CRR invited me, and uh, they have a great uh, presentation already. So I'd like to take a look at uh, Japan uh, in kind of and show Japan in a kind of different light uh, through my uh, lens. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm uh, running a company called Abovo, and Abovo is uh, Latin uh, and literally from the egg. And uh, in Old English, it's called. Uh, it means from the very beginning. I started um, using this above uh, quite a long time ago, uh, probably more than 15 years ago. And at that time, I just used this above uh, as in an well, interesting name. And that was a music and kind of film project at that time. But then uh, about 10 some years ago, I uh, changed my kind of shift my work to uh, environmental and social uh, kind of milieu. Then I uh, started um, hoping um, uh, with this name that, that the world will start again with a fresh, sustainable and a responsible mind. Okay, next slide, please. And um, what, what is Abovo? Why am I uh, talking about Abovo? Because uh, this is a creative production company based in Tokyo, and I have been working uh, with uh, NGO, environmental, social NGO, um, in and out of Japan, last 15 years. And uh, we are creating works that convey important messages to people and societies, because our world has been and is already filled with commercial messages. Um, here, the commercial message mean um, is to sell the things but uh, almost sell things, um, anything, but uh, sometimes the things that we're not necessarily needing. Um, this is a kind of the problem in uh, contemporary society. Uh, this commercial message is almost too aggressive, compulsive, obsessive, I found. And this um, compulsiveness uh, of this commercial message somewhat, I think, uh, imply and leads us to this uh, important discussion that uh, CRRs are talking about uh, on environmental issues and also on the sustainability. Next slide, please. And to me, uh, what is creativity? Uh, why is creativity necessary? Because to me, the creativity to uh, look at things in a different light um, enable us show things in a different light because we are in everyday life uh, people tend to repeat things without realizing things become somewhat habitual repeating things uh, makes us think uh, or like put us uh, into kind of conformity and a biased mode um, and th this is where the creativity is kind of required i think creativity uh, could, can, can put us into a kind of different kind of mode, uh, can change the pace and uh, give us a unique approach to the difficult topics. Um, the deep reason why I talk about creativity is um, uh, I think we, are, uh, we talk about this creativity things probably um, quite a lot, I think, in this uh, society, but I think we're still underestimating the, the potential of creativity still. And I think in the creativity is in every one of us. And we all have it, but we are not quite using it. So what I suggest is to try to unlock creativity in ourselves, in our everyday life. And that I think can lead us to more sustainable and responsible world we're concerned about and we dream of. And I think it can uh, accelerate the paradigm shift that I think we long for. Next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, and okay, Japan. Um, so we're talking about Japan now. So um, why the Japan has uh, a lot of problems uh, with this uh, sustainability or what the CRR actually pointed out at NDPE, uh, non-compliance and all that kind of things. Okay, Japan is the third largest economy still and behind the USA and China. And uh, therefore from outside world, I think the market is still bigger relatively compared with other countries. But I think the Japan and Japanese consumers now uh, don't really think they, uh, their market is that influential. And, and well, I think they're thinking that the uh, market is declining rather than inclining. And the, their responsibility, the sense of responsibility is somewhat uh, declining as well, I think. Or like, I don't know, it, it has been not there so much, I think they can't really think of the impacts that they have in this world so much yet. And why is that? Next slide, please. Why Japanese consumers not so aware? Okay, um, this is a bit of that kind of cultural issue as well. And this cultural background, uh, I'd like to go through a little bit. So um, consumers are more interested in domestic issues rather than global issues. Uh, this is something to do with uh, I think our educational system, uh, our uh, sort of social norms, and uh, it's um, from the kind of a, a social, cultural, educational uh, kind of angle, it's always uh, pre preventing a lot of people from voicing their opinions and forming debates. Openly talk about things is not quite a virtue here. Um, somewhat uh, being quiet, being obedience is uh, more valued. So that's why I don't think that kind of social action is not yet there so much uh, compared with the kind of Western European countries or America, or even uh, compared with Southeast Asia, I think you know, Japanese people are quieter. And uh, that actually gives us uh, a lot of problems when we uh, do uh, campaigns, uh, a lot of uh, work uh, for the social, uh, uh, in terms of the social kind of campaigns. And uh, this also uh, endorses the aristocracy and bureaucracy uh, in a society. So it's more difficult uh, to have a barriers. And Olympics, uh, well, we don't know uh, if the Olympics going to happen now, but Olympics uh, even didn't really change so much that, that part of society, I think. And also, uh, and concretely, the, the palm oil, uh, the, the, in terms of palm oil, uh, palm oil uh, is not really uh, so recognized in this country because uh, the, the products are not properly labeled uh, with palm oil. Palm oil is still invisible. Uh, it's called vegetable oil. Next slide, please. So how are we approach this issue? Okay, so now uh, I'm talking about the Plantation Watch, which is like uh, the NGO consortium uh, based in Japan. And I'm part of uh, this Plantation Watch for about seven, eight years. I'm a kind of media partner of Plantation Watch then taking care of websites and uh, films, uh, et cetera. And uh, reaching out, and we have been uh, doing a campaign, uh, trying to reach out to the people through online, um, uh, many websites. And one of the websites actually collected 60, uh, almost 65,000 unique click actions uh, in this six, seven years of action. Um, when we started this, actually the palm oil was like very, very invisible and not many people knew about it. But now through our website, I think uh, fairly many people started knowing about it, but still not uh, as many as I think the European or like America, I think. Um, but now that our website, one of our websites shown at the uh, top of Google's uh, search results when you put palm oil in Japanese. So uh, it is actually uh, going a little bit. And some encouraging news, actually, last year, the 2020, um, it is actually shown in a report of the CRR, if you uh, care to look at it later. Um, there are two power plants, uh, the Palmo power plants, um, 
one was operated already and one was in the plan and they are actually stopped by the civil society action so this was like quite a big these were the quite big news last year for us because um, it, it changed uh, quite a bit of like the societal kind of norm that we talked about um, earlier. Um, people kind of voiced their, their opinions, their, their uh, um, feelings towards uh, this issue, then they, they stopped the pipelines. So that was a great uh, effort actually. And also we have been making uh, educational materials to do the kind of workshop about palm oil issues. Uh, so uh, these are kind of approaches that we made. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, this this is the uh, the website I, I talked about. One of the uh, popular websites that we created. This is a kind of mimic of the um, uh, about seven years ago we launched this, and at that time we kind of mimics the uh, kind of popular blog sites. It looks a bit tacky and it looks a bit kind of messy, but actually people liked it and they like the kind of graphics and they, they kind of enjoy i think reading the top pages so that we uh, actually created now that about six uh, sixty five thousand people unique uh, clicks there and we use these numbers to uh, as in a leverage to talk to the kind of corporations uh using the palm oil and we ask the questions to those one of those big companies that which products they actually use the palm oil and we ask them you know, to put palm oil rather than vegetable oils. So these are kind of uh, actions that we created. Next slide, please. Okay, so now, um, well, this is not kind of new thing. Uh, of course, I mean, this is rather like relevant in, in all the parts of the world right now, but uh, we are actually living with abundance of information. And although, you know, all, quite a lot of information is quite important uh it is difficult to reach uh the necessary audience uh so we need to uh really able to catch attention of um the viewers um and also we need to uh think about our creativity in terms of that and also um we need to disseminate the facts and stories to uh, move the audience towards a more sustainable lifestyle that has to be done uh, very quickly too. I think we are running out of time. Uh, as we know, the uh, UN, I mean, UN um, and those uh, sustainable development goals uh, since 2015, but now the 2021, uh, we haven't seen so much kind of progress yet. So um, I think this, you know, UN SDGs goals and also the, uh, all the parts of the society real need to um, make an effort to change and uh, transform you know our behaviors uh, to uh, strive to, uh, to um, the more sustainable and responsible society next slide please okay so now uh, in terms of COVID-19 uh, actually Tokyo is still uh, suffering and I think Many parts of Europe, America, um, the world are suffering, and the COVID 19 had changed a lot of our lives here, too. Um, but um, ironic, but actually, COVID 19 may bring us uh, together in the world, like of this kind of seminar. Uh, I found, you know, there, there are many, many seminars, webinars done internationally now, uh, more than before, about actually um, this COVID 19 situation created us to join a lot of uh, international events like this. So actually, uh, we can uh, take, use this as a leverage to collaborate and incorporate uh, beyond borders. And maybe um, we can accelerate the change um, boy, after, uh, or like, well, I hope that we, we're going to cope with this COVID-19, but before and after after the COVID-19, we can accelerate the change. So, um, yeah, and with the CRR, uh, with that kind of uh, great um, documentation and the, the data, um, I think, you know, we can uh, put forward the, the change a lot, and as well as like, you know, make an effort from this kind of creative kind of industry as well. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Yuki, that was great. And thanks to Ender and Sarah for your presentation. We now have a few minutes um, to do some Q&A. So if you have any questions, please enter them in the uh, Q&A function. The first question is for Sarah. Could you talk about what kind of supply chain due diligence companies should take to decrease their risks? And are there third parties that could be, are there third parties that could um, implement increased oversight for the companies? Yes, thank you for the questions. Um, I'm actually happy with this question because it's some uh, free promotion for our uh, Asian uh, spin-off. Uh, because uh, Aid Environment uh, has a, an Asian spin-off called Earth Equalizer, uh, and I can send some more details later in the chat function. Uh, but this organization is actually a third-party uh, supplier monitoring, doing third-party supplier monitoring, because for Indonesia or for Southeast Asia, uh, Aid Environment and Earth Equalizer have the largest data set of all oil palm concessions, uh, mail and refinery locations, corporate ownership data. It covers around 21 million hectares. Um, so obviously companies like Fuji Oil, they can, uh, yeah, they can do third party supplier monitoring by such organizations or they can do them themselves, these kind of screening of suppliers. Uh, but it's very difficult to, to map suppliers, uh, as you will probably know that it's sometimes very difficult to know who is actually the, the first tire supplier. Um, yeah, so basically I, I can say that, that uh, our Asian uh, partner organization, Earth Equalizer, is an organization that can do that, sort, that kind of uh, screening. Uh, next question for the group of panelists. Uh, could you explain the role of the Japanese Clean Wood Act and how it affects Japanese trading companies? Um, so I can answer that question. Um, the, the Japanese Clean Wood Act is actually more a kind of legality requirement uh, in Japan for um, corporations that operate um, in the timber sector, um, they need to basically um, meet some requirements to be able to import um, wood products uh, into Japan. Um, and it's because it's a legality, uh, it's more legality requirement, we haven't uh, really looked uh, into its role uh, for this paper because we, we conducted more a type of um, sustainability assessment. Uh, but we can, um, considering that all these big companies in the paper that are featured uh, in the paper are um, important market players um, and that are, they are all um, FSC certified, we can probably assume it's very likely that those companies are registered under this act. Um, but again, legality does not mean sustainability. It does not always equal sustainability. Um, so it's just good to keep in mind um, it's two different things. Great, thank you so much for that response. Uh, the next question is about NDPE commitments. Could you t um, this is for Sarah and Ender. Could you talk about um, NDPE commitments and how they do not necessarily, they're not necessarily implemented or enforced? And can you connect these risks in terms of dollar values? And there, so this is dollar values. I think that's yeah, sure. the part. <laughs> sure. uh, well, uh, actually we can break it, this down to two. Uh, if the, this, these companies are uh, public companies, public trade companies, so it, it will concern investors. And with that, well, there are uh, some studies of um, uh, environmental or reputation damaging events, and that is, uh, well, if uh, if this NDP co commitment is not enforced, then uh, it may cause, in the end, a, a, a reputation damaging event. So uh, that 
the outcome, the, the dollar value outcome is more, more dependent on how the company reacts or reacts, responds to it. So uh, we did a very large group of examples uh, from uh, almost 20 years of data. It shows that uh, the companies who respond uh, good in a way that they, they uh, answer the questions and uh, they go publicly, uh, they, they explain their uh, response publicly, then they actually gain from this. Uh, these events and uh, they almost gain 20% in their uh, company value, the market value increase on average. And with bad responders, it's the opposite, it's uh, minus 29%. So uh, when you think about these events and uh, the dollar value of it, if this is, this is a public company, you can uh, uh, you should assess first uh, the, the response of the company and then maybe we can attach a, a dollar value that is between like 20% positive or 29% ne negative. But uh, what we did for let's say cow uh, and Fuji oil with uh, in, in, in any event of rep reputation damage in the land, uh, they, they uh, calculated on their CDP disclosures a value, but that was only for uh, the lost revenues. Uh, in terms of valuations, we took that loss revenues and uh, made the calculation with their uh, trading multiples, current trading multiples, and that was almost five times higher. The valuation risk was five times higher. And if we go one step further and uh, apply this 20% positive or 29% negative methodology, and that would be almost 10%, uh, 10 times higher risk for those companies. Hope that explains it. Great, thank you so much, Ender. And to the next question is about um, smallholders uh, and their work with um, Japanese companies. Um, could um, one of the panelists discuss um, how farmers on palm oil in Indonesia connect with um, major companies in Japan? Mm, okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm not totally familiar with the small farmers in Indonesia, but partly uh, I have um, had a conversation with NGOs and stuff. And um, well, I'm sure the Kao Nishin, uh, those corporations are interested in uh, kind of smallholders, um, dealing with smallholders. And I heard that they, they are actually looking for the, um, the route to connect uh, with the smallholders. But, I think uh, with those big corporations, uh, the smallholders need to um, gather uh, together as a group um, because they need uh, the uh, mass uh, of oil. Basically, these big companies cannot deal with a uh, smallholders each uh, each smallholders individually, so they need to gather around as a group uh, and uh, make their own. Um, uh, the the certi well probably like certification co uh, qualified uh, like kind of uh, their own kind of a group certification or something to uh, present their 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 um, uh, compliance and the sustainability commitments. Um, but at the same time, uh, we need to be careful because uh, big corporations tend to approach the smallholders to. Uh, make kind of their own images better um, uh, the, for the sake of like a uh, green image or I wouldn't say the green wash, but um, yeah, that, that kind of uh, thing can be uh, taken as a, a bit of like, um, yeah, green strategy. If, I'm sorry, that is a bit of a like snarkiness, but so. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Yuki. The next and last question um, is um, directed to either um, Yuki or Sarah. What are the top steps Japanese companies exposed to deforestation or supply chains need to do to be in the uh, best of class uh, globally? Oh. Um. I see that Ariane, you, you want to say something about this? 
Um, yeah, um, so I think Japan is not different from other markets in that sense. Um, and what we need from companies is actually um, that they basically adopt stronger commitments, um, stronger policies regarding their own operations, um, and that they um, implement those commitments. Um, and so this implementation can um, be done through um, thorough due diligence uh, processes, um, through monitoring um, the, the company's supply chain, um, monitoring um, suppliers' operation, um, and um, also disclosing um, the list of uh, their list of suppliers. Um, because public information helps um, public monitoring, if I can say, <laughs> of uh, commitments. Um, and companies need to also engage um, any case uh, when there, are, there is actually deforestation cases happening in their supply chain. Um, it's, it's important for companies to react um, and to ensure that they stay compliant with their own policies. Um, and so to engage their suppliers that are having um, issues um, and work with them um, together to help them basically um, meet their um, NDP um, requirement, their NDP standards. Um, so th there are a lot of possibilities. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot, Ariana. Um, so f um, we're now out of time. Um, there are some questions we didn't uh, get to today, but please feel free to follow up with any of us on this report or any other reports that we've published. And so th thanks a lot for everybody for your time. So from all of us for, at CRR, we'd like to thank you for joining.